Faith for Today with Colin Urquhart and Julia Fisher. We've been discussing wisdom this week, Colin, and uh, you've just said we're going to have to do another week on this because we've hardly started. It's so interesting. (laughs) But uh, the message that's coming through loud and clear that wisdom really is the most precious gift there is. It's a thing we should be seeking after more than anything else. Yes, and it has such practical ramifications, both for us, our well-being, our soul, the well-being of our souls, but also our physical well-being. It affects our health. And we're, we're going through these early chapters, the first eight chapters of Proverbs, seeing what we can learn about this wisdom. We will eventually get to the New Testament and what what uh, is said about wisdom there. But uh, these chapters of Proverbs are so rich. In chapter 3, verse 13, blessed is the man who finds wisdom, the man who gains understanding. Remember that spiritual understanding. It's not understanding things with the natural, but it's understanding things with the mind of the Spirit, with the mind of Christ. For she, now this is where... um, the in the book of proverbs wisdom now becomes personalized in a feminine form god has been speaking of himself as wisdom first of all then there is this transition to speaking of wisdom uh, really i i think epitomizing what we as the bride of christ are to be you see god is not going to come back for a foolish church jesus is not coming back for a foolish church He's not coming back for a sin-filled church. He is going to come back for a church that is walking in wisdom. Uh, And an awful lot has got to happen between now and when Jesus comes again because there is a lot of foolishness that goes on in churches today, a lot that is opposed to the will of God, the word of God. But here we we read that... um, Uh, The man is blessed who finds wisdom, the man who gains understanding. And then uh, the scripture says that wisdom is more precious than silver, than gold, than rubies, precious stones. But then in verse 16, we have the repetition of what we saw earlier in the week. Long life is in her right hand, and in her left hand are riches and honor. This shows what God wants for us as his people. He wants us to prosper. He wants us to be in health. He wants us to be honored both by God and people. Oh, yes, yes, yes. There will be times we'll be persecuted and dishonored. But you see, God will honor us even when we face persecution. Uh, Her ways, the ways of wisdom are pleasant ways, the scripture said, and all her paths are peace. She is a tree of life to those who embrace her. Those who lay hold of her will be blessed. One of the things I love, you see, about these early chapters of wisdom is God, first of all, speaks of himself as wisdom, and then it's as if he's married to wisdom, (laughs) if you can talk of God being married. But we we are to be the bride of Christ, aren't we? In other words, wisdom begets wisdom. Wisdom relates to wisdom. Wisdom is at one with wisdom. So we are at one with God, who is wisdom, when we, as the bride of Christ, live and speak and work with wisdom in obedience to his will and purposes. Then God explains that wisdom existed. Again, we have this personification of wisdom um, as God. Wisdom existed before creation because God is our wisdom. So by wisdom, the Lord laid the earth's foundations. By understanding, he set the heavens in place. By his knowledge, the deeps were divided and the clouds let drop the dew. What's the significance of this? 
God created in wisdom. Now, God created through Jesus, didn't he? He was the word of God that went forth from the mouth of God and brought everything into being. By him all things were made that have been made. Now, why is this important? Because in the New Testament, Jesus becomes our wisdom from God. And we will come on next week to talk about that. But you see, he is our wisdom because he always has been the wisdom of God. God created in wisdom. So when we look at the universe, not just the creation of this earth, but even when we look at the creation of the earth as it is, we know that this expresses the wisdom of God. And you see in the infinite detail of creation uh, just how wise God has been setting things in the order in which he has. So if we are wise, the scripture goes on to say, my son, preserve, so this is again wisdom, it's God, preserve sound judgment and discernment. Do not let them out of your sight. They will be life for you, an ornament to grace your neck. Then you will go on your way in safety, and your foot will not stumble. When you lie down, you will not be afraid. When you lie down, your sleep will be sweet. Have no fear of sudden disaster or of the ruin that overtakes the wicked, for the Lord will be your confidence and will keep your foot from being snared. All that, all those promises, are the outworking of wisdom in our lives. So then, because we have to express that wisdom practically, the scripture goes on to say, do not withhold good from those who deserve it when it is in your power to act. Do not say to your neighbor, come back later, I'll give it tomorrow, when you have it with you now. Do not plot harm against your neighbor who lives trustfully near you. Do not accuse a man for no reason when he has done you no harm. You see, to act in those ways would be foolish, wouldn't it? It would be to go against the will of God. Do not envy a violent man or choose any of his ways. For the Lord detests a perverse man, but takes the upright into his confidence. That's quite a statement, isn't it? Yeah, now there's a lot, quite a bit that's going to be said in the following chapters about perversity. That we've got to keep perversity from our hearts and from our mouths. Now what is perversity? Perversity is whatever is perverse, whatever goes against what God says, and therefore what God desires. So keep perversity out of your heart, keep perversity out of your mouth. Do not make choices that are in opposition to the will of God. Do not say things that are in opposition to the will of God. Do not treat others in ways that are in opposition to the will of God, but be wise. Do to others as God would want you to. Uh, treat them as he would treat them, with love, compassion, mercy, grace. Be an encourager, not an accuser. Be very positive in the way that you deal with people, rather than negative. Because the man detests, the, sorry, the Lord detests a perverse man. Then this chapter ends by saying he, that is God, who is wisdom, mocks proud mockers, but gives grace to the humble. The wise inherit honor, but fools he holds up to shame. And of course, sin, when it is uncovered and revealed, which happens when there has been no repentance for that sin, sin leads to shame. And one of the things that 
Jesus did on the cross for us was he died a shameful death because it was a shameful death to be crucified as a convicted criminal. He died a shameful death, although he didn't deserve that, to actually save us, to deliver us, to free us from all shame in our lives. So, chapter 4 begins, Listen, my sons, to a father's instruction. Pay attention and gain understanding. I give you sound learning, so do not forsake my teaching. The wise Christian is a man or woman of the word of God. He or she does not depend upon their own opinions, but upon what God says. Now you see how much foolishness there is in some churches today because the decisions they make and the things they teach depend upon the understanding of man and not upon the wisdom of God. And it is for that reason there is no fear of God in our land. Because if there's no fear of God in the church, there will be no fear of God in the nation. So the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. God wants to bring us back to wisdom, back to the fear of the Lord, back to obedience to his will and purposes. You've been listening to Faith for Today, presented by Julia Fisher. This program is sponsored by Kingdom Faith. For further information, visit our website, kingdomfaith.com. 